anybody there? It seems I'm all alone again. Does anybody care? This planet's empty. I see no signs of life. Please don't tell me that the human race did not survive. There are no people in the future. There are no people. There are no people in the future. No people at all. There are no people in the future. Where did all my people go? There are no people. Let me try my people call. Where are my people? Where are my people? I guess I'll fly away. Hey everybody, everybody, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Yes, my mic. My mic. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. It is Friday, February, February. What am I talking about? March 29th, 2024. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Friday Politics Roundup. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Each week we break down the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. You can support the show, become a patron for as little as five bucks a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash RC press for all the details. You can help out the show by heading over to our YouTube channel if you're not there already. Smash that subscribe button, like the stream for this show, and hit that notification bell so you know every time that we go live. And if you're one of our awesome podcast listeners, make sure to leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you listen on. Leave a comment to let other folks know why you like the show. Little things like this help other people find the show. Well, today's program, a lot going on in the news this week, uh, that's for sure. Um, biggest one that is all over the headlines all throughout the week. A container ship, of course, hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, causing the bridge to collapse and six workers to lose their lives. Um, this is going to be, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going around around that in terms of how this problem <laughs> or how this accident is being interpreted. Uh, we'll get into that. And after John Fetterman stakes out a hawkish support of Israel and distance himself from progressives, well, guess what? His staff is checking out. Yep, they're leaving him in droves. And former senator and vice presidential candidate Joe Lieberman died this week. Let that signal the passing of one of the more destructive factions and ideologies of the Democratic Party. NBC hires, then fires, Ronna McDaniel. You know, that election-denying former head of the GOP. Yeah, that was an interesting uh, roller coaster this week. And school absences, according to new reports, school absences have exploded and continue in the post-COVID world, causing all sorts of complications and problems within schools and for kids. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that because, yeah, because there's a lot there. And then there's also the way that this is also being interpreted and some of the assumptions that have been made since since COVID that I, I, I think are kind of destructive, but we'll, we'll get back to that. A lot of higher education news this week. Um, just a flood of it. Just check that this is a sampling. The University of Florida is going after faculty members um, that they think interfered with the university's new Hamilton Center for Classical and Civic Education. What is that? Well, that's the newly established beachhead for the so-called classical education and the Western canon. Those are the buzzwords but used by Christian nationalists and far-right activists seeking to whitewash American education and bolster white Christian and celebratory narrative about the U.S., right, and the founders, right? Um, so you can find what's, what... Governor DeSantis has been doing down there in Florida. If you've been seeing what's happening with Moms for Liberty and what happened in our Penridge School District and Central Buck School District and now it's happening in the Ole School District, happened in Kutztown School District and Souderton and Palisades, well, this is the same thing, right? Same thing. And at Boston University, well, you know, they have some uh, graduate students are on strike there. I kind of highlighted this last week. Um, But they are now on strike. And the administration, you know, just trying to be helpful, had some suggestions for faculty members um, during that current strike about, you know, what to do. You know, um, they had a great suggestion. Just trying to help out. Hey, you know what? You know all that stuff that the graduate students did? Why don't you just have AI do it instead? Yeah, have AI do it. You don't need those stinking grad students. Have AI do the comments and suggestions and all that kind of stuff. Just have the AI do it. Yep, here we go. For all my friends out there who are like, oh, you know, I, I think this whole idea about AI replacing workers is a little bit overblown. Well, here you go. And notice that these are workers 
that are in higher ed, <laughs> right? These are the workers that exactly, I mean, not just the higher ed workers, but these are the workers that, you know, again, have been pointed to that AI is targeting, but we'll see. And here's another one. A new Indiana law is going to require professors to promote intellectual diversity or face disciplinary actions. Intellectual diversity. Hmm. Sounds good. Like, well, what is that? Well, it means entertaining even fascist ideas as just another set of ideas. Was Hitler wrong? Right? Well, how do we assess Hitler? Well, you got to entertain all the ideas. Well, let's look at this argument. Well, let's argument for Hitler and arguments against Hitler. And who are we to decide? These are the same people, ironically, right, who were so against, like, postmodernism and talk about relativism and all this other kind of stuff. Really, this is nothing but making sure that right-wing agendas, right, and right-wing students that are infected with this agenda don't have their foo-foos hurting when they find out that facts in the world matter, that genocide is not a good thing. Right? Anyways, one more. University of Kentucky's president seeks to disband their faculty senate and turn decision-making over to their board of trustees. Because, you know, all those kind of real estate people and rich folks that are on the board of trustees, trustees they're in a much better decision-making decision, uh, decision -making position. And, you know, their expertise in kind of, you know, making money and kind of like shaking hands and stuff like that is much better than, you know, the expertise that faculty bring. <laughs> what do they bring? <laughs> yeah. In other news, Bucks County sues Big Oil for lying about the climate, uh, climate crisis. That's huge. And PA's primary is right around the corner. We'll give you about the dates and the deadlines you need to know. That's just some of the stuff we'll get check on today. We'll see what we get through. We've got a, there's a bunch of stuff that's happening this week. A lot of things going on, but you know, we'll see what we get to today. And for more PA Progressive Talk, check out the Rick Smith Show's live stream every night at 9 p.m. And check out his YouTube channel, Twitter, and Facebook. And subscribe to his podcast wherever you get his podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Go to ricksmithshow.com for the latest across all his platforms. And the Sisters of the Night Caucus podcast is rocking it. The amazing PA women stirring the political cauldron behind this podcast rock the house. And they know where the bodies are buried. Make sure to follow them on Twitter at The Night Caucus. That's at The Night Caucus on Twitter. And subscribe to their podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And The Signal is a podcast for the Bucks County Beacon. The Signal is hosted by Bucks uh, by Ed Beacon's editor-in-chief, Cyril Michaleko, and produced by yours truly. Twice a month, The Signal will shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. Cyril invites guests who can provide insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive roots. Check out that podcast at buckscountybeacon.podbean.com. And the Civic Circle is also a podcast for the Bucks County Beacon that tackles politics and policy from a Gen Z lens. Sarah Zhang, Mallory Marson, and Alexandra Coffey are students from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And once a month, they chat about activism, advocacy, and all the political happenings affecting their generation today. Check them out at the Civic Circle or just civiccircle.podbean.com. For all you gamers out there, the Game In, that's with two N's, the Game In is a Quakertown-based black family-owned gaming store. They're friends of the show, and they've got everything from Retro N64s, the latest consoles, video games for all platforms, collectibles, action figures, Funko Pops, walls of Funko Pops. And kids get discounts when they get good grades, so check them out. Got a question about a game, look for something hard to get, they've got you covered. Check them out at their Facebook page or follow them on Twitter at, at the Game In. that's with two N's. Shoot a message or drop them an email at thegameinpa at gmail.com. And if you find yourself in the Kutztown area, you've got to check out the Heart and Hearth Deli and Smokehouse located at 466 West Main Street. That's Kitty Corner to the from the Kutztown University campus. Heart and Hearth is an American bistro featuring barbecue and French-inspired fare, all with locally sourced and organic ingredients. And uh, Colleen and Jim are freaking awesome. Colleen's a good friend of mine. Um, she runs the place. Uh, she's an amazing cook and just an awesome person. So go do check that out. That's 466 West Main Street. Um, in Kutztown. And a shout out goes to Jonathan Mann, who wrote our intro song, There Are No People in the Future. And check out all his great stuff on his YouTube page and follow him on Twitter at, at Song of Day Man, two N's at Song of Day Man on Twitter. So, look, everybody, we want a progressive future. We need progressive media. Support Pull No Punch's homegrown progressive media today. Become a patron of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Head on over to patreon.com slash rcpress for all the details. We're here for the fight, but we need you. Become a patron for the price of a good beer once a month. 
Help keep the media in the movement, the movement, the media. Become a patron for as little as five bucks a month by going to patreon.com slash RC press today. Well, everybody, I uh, hope you're doing well today. Um, I have uh, some nasty little allergies going on for me today. So um, it is what it is. I mean, it's that time of year. Uh, I got to say, I'm very much looking forward to getting my hands in the garden um, and uh, start the next season. <laughs> oh, man, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Um, what I'm going to be, um, you know, it's like it's one of these things. It's one of these uh, one of the, one of these years uh, at my job, right, where at Kutztown, where it's, uh, you know, it's just beat me down this time. <laughs> it just beat me down. Um, you've heard me talk about, you know, we've got this this new uh, registration system for students and things like this, and it's uh, it's it's just whatever. It's just a it's a, it's a time suck. It's yet another time suck. And you know this how this works, right? I mean, you know how it works at jobs where they sit there and say, oh, you know, you just try. Uh, um, it's just, 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 you know, one more thing, just so, or just this one more training, or you just got to do this one more thing, or, oh, you know, oh, oh, you didn't know, don't know how to do that. Oh, check out these 10 videos, right? And, you know, it's like, I, you know, all that stuff, even, even if you were to kind of look at this as all just well-intentioned, right? You know, so, oh yeah, we're just trying to kind of help. It's like, it's all thrust back, you know, down on the people who actually have to do the work, right? In this case, you know, us faculty members and things like this and staff members, and then, so you're sitting there, you find out that you're just time goes, goes out the window and you're wondering, how the hell did I get behind in this other stuff, right? You, I should be, I've been working my brains off and blah, 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 but that's the way it's been. It's been just really, really frustrating and annoying and all that kind of fun stuff. But so anyways, yeah, I mean, this, this, what happened in, uh, in Baltimore this week was just like unbelievable. I mean, it, it devastating, um, I mean, workers lost their lives. I mean, I, I, it's it's remarkable that more people um, did not lose their lives. I mean, combination of luck, um, quick response, and uh, the fact that it was in the middle of the night. Um, that, that's about it, right? I mean, that didn't help the workers who were actually working repairing potholes on the on the bridge, right, in the middle of the night. Um, I mean, they lost their lives. Um, I, I have been, you know, look, I mean, it's a devastating accident. I mean, what are you going to do? Right. And I, I mean, it's, it's not the kind of thing, you know, despite whatever kind of, you know, the right wing kind of trolls on, you know, fantasy hackers, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, it was just watching that crew just try to kind of blame the bridge or, you know, brain blame this on, you know, some kind of Chinese cyber attack or DEI policies. And then they go after, you know, the, all bunch of the racists get up, you know, get up in the, like, you know, on their feeds and start calling them the Balt, the mayor, the Baltimore, uh, the mayor of Baltimore as a DEI mayor, right? Because he's black. Right. I mean, so all the racism comes out, they just kind of show their all hands and all the stuff, their fantasies come out. They start constructing in real time, new conspiracy theories, you know, whatever. But, so there's that, right? I mean, that little kind of sideshow that goes on um, with these people. That's just their normal. They actually believe all this crap, and they just want to stir this stuff up. But there's a, a, a few things about the way that this is being discussed now that I, both point to major problems and, and really kind of systemic issues and um, well, let me just put it like this. There is this article in the uh, the Independent, right? Um, it's a UK paper, or whatever, like this. It's a US edition, whatever. So I just, just so I want to read a couple of things here and just want to talk about the way that this narrative is getting constructed here, right? So the headline is Baltimore Key Bridge Collapse, latest news, and then, in quote, structural failure to blame as massive cleanup begins. All right, so that alone as a, you know, if anybody who saw the footage of what happened there, right, I mean, you would be, I think, be forgiven if you wondered why 
you see the structural failure is 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 to blame in this headline as opposed to a like I don't know what, how many tons was it? <laughs> this is an enormous cargo ship crashed into a pylon head on. That was the reason. That's to blame, right? The, the crash into the bridge was to blame, right? It's not as if the bridge just kind of collapsed by itself. So whatever. I just thought that was a little bit of a strange headline, <laughs> right? So, um, but then if you look at the article, uh, God, what is going on with my highlights and stuff here? I've got this, you know, program that I, or this, uh, this tool that I use to highlight stuff, um, highlight articles and things like this that has been just, just not working of late. And it's really strange. Um, let me see if I can just pull up this other version of this. So I'm just going to have to go through and re-highlight stuff. Okay, so here you go. Oh, no, this is a different one. Uh, shoot, 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 shoot. Well, no, they don't have it. So let me just read you this part about what, what they say in this, um, in the article. So here's the article. Structural failures are to blame for the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore, experts have said, as a massive cleanup operation begins. While it is too early to say exactly what happened during the collision and the collapse that resulted, experts have revealed that the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which was designed in the 1970s, might not have been designed with the vast size and power of the ships that sail under it today in mind. Quote, it's conceivable that the piers weren't designed to withstand the magnitude of today's ship's impacts, as vessels like the Dolly weren't navigating the Port of Baltimore during the era, said Professor, um, Professor Toby um, Matram of the University of Warwick. Right? And then it goes on. So just look at the, how that's constructed, right? It's, it's conceivable that, the, you know, some so they failed in the construction of the bridge, Right. That maybe they, you know, they didn't kind of, you know, keep these ships in mind. Let's be clear. The, the, the size of these ships did not exist then. Right. It, it, it's like it's the size of the ships, right? The massive ships and the way that they are piling these ships, like, you know, are piling more and more onto these ships, these, these massive container ships. That's what has changed. Right. So it's not a failure in the design of the bridge. Right. It's the fact that the bridge was designed. Right. To I mean, look, you could actually see the way that it was kind of set up. It's not, yes, that was designed to kind of withstand impacts. But the fact is, is that somebody made decisions along the way to allow larger and larger ships into that port. Without taking into consideration the kinds of infrastructure upgrades that would be necessary to keep people safe, right? That is a more accurate description of these two things, massive ship and a, a bridge, right? So in addition to like the bigger issues around infrastructure, right, that, you know, the U.S. does not invest in our infrastructure, Right, that we just let it rot away because we this deem that anything that has to do with the public good is something that is bad somehow. So we don't invest in infrastructure. We have some of the worst roads in the developed world. We have, you know, crumbling bridges. You know, Pennsylvania has some of the worst bridges in the country, one of the worst roads in the country. But we know that there's report after report, we talk about this on the show too as well, about the failure of the United States government to invest in our infrastructure. It shows the success of the neoliberal right-wing free market for all version of the way we should conduct a society. We see the victory of that in the way that we conduct this society. In other words, it's not profitable for a private company to go and fix a bridge and keep it up to date because there's no money in that. The only people that can do that, the only way that we can have that good kind of infrastructure is for the government to invest in it, to be to, to have it built. And, you know, again, once the government does that, whether it's a state government or a federal government, once they do that, guess what happens? All sorts of people profit from it. Right. Lots of workers are hired. Right. Companies get contracts to fix stuff and all that kind of thing. Right. So there's lots of economic activity that happens once the government invests in that. 
but we have been can we have been kind of we have been conditioned to believe that that is a bad thing for the government to invest in things because what does the government mean what does the government mean it means our tax dollars and so we're told that taxes are bad that the government is reaching in your pocket and blah 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 so instead of ours as a society instead of blaming corporations for outsourcing our jobs and therefore kind of declining our, our, our life instead of kind of blaming corporations and kind of kind of right wing policies and neoliberal Democrats, instead of blaming them for basically saying, because of you, you we shipped all the good jobs away. We've seen an anti-union push and we've seen flat wages. No, what we're going to say is that, no, it's the government taking our money away. They're the, they're the culprits. If anything, this is kind of. They, they're kind of the neoliberal Democrat and the right wing politicians, right? All those folks together over the past 50 years have slowly walked us away from the public good and, and said, we're not going to think about each other. And we're not going to see this as a community or a society. Nope. We want you to think only of yourselves as individuals, consumers. That's it. And the government is trying to control you, trying to take from you. That's the better narrative for the past 50 years, 40 years, right? So this is, a, this is a perfect example, right? This is the kind of thing that you can anticipate, right? And I am sure we are going to see hearings. We are going to hear hearings about this stuff, right? They're going to look into all this kind of safety issues, and we are going to find that somewhere there were people probably engineers, probably safety experts were like this, who were pointing to this as a problem. Right? You have a harbor that is designed for smaller ships, and you are forcing that harbor now to a harbor to accept much larger ships. There's going to be consequences of this. It's not brain surgery to figure that stuff out. All you got to do is kind of say, okay, if we do X, what's the consequence? What happens? Let's game that out and let's kind of see, okay, if these are going to be the consequences, do we want to do it? Number one. And if we do want to do it, what are the things that we need to do to make sure that, that safety is kind of upheld? Pretty straightforward. But we're told that those things are not supposed to be good. Safety, sacrifice safety for profit. And in this case, who's profiting, right? Well, it's the shipping companies. So on the BBC the other night, um, not it wasn't the night of the collision. Uh, it wasn't that next day of the collision. I think it was the day after that, I believe. Um, the, uh, the BBC NewsHour, they were interviewing... Um, some guy, some guy who's like, you know, logistics specialist, you, you know, U.S. logistic guy, some kind of corporate dude. But I appreciated the interview and I appreciated the guy they inter the uh, guy that they interviewed because he kind of basically put his finger right on the problem, right? He wasn't trying to kind of like be a whistleblower or cause problems. He was just trying to like say, hey, you know, this is how it is. And what he said was that part of the issue is that we're looking at kind of the safety of these ships because there's a big question, right? So there's the, inf the infrastructure we just talked about. Second one is like, what about the safety of the ship? How is it that this massive ship that could do such damage, how is it that it lost power, right? How is it that it, just, it kind of failed in such a spectacular way, right? Well, and it's, you know, that raises questions again about safety, what's happening on board, like was this inspected and all this stuff. And what this guy basically says is, well, look, he said what we've done over the past, I think he, I, I want to say over the past decade, uh, maybe it's a little bit longer period of time, but I, I believe you said over the past decade, what, we, what we've seen is push in the shipping industry was to minimize the amount of downtime that each ship has and maximize its movement. Right. So in other words, instead of coming into port, going through a, th a thorough inspection, going through making sure that everything is kind of safe each time to come into port. Nope. They want just superficial and superficial kind of look. If there's any major problems, let's go. Then let's get back out there. Which means, according to this guy, according to that inspections, just kind of aren't paid attention to as much. Or there's really not time to do thorough inspections on a consistent basis. So safety is sacrificed in order, because you think about it, a container ship, like if you have a container ship that stays in port a day, as opposed to eight hours, 
right? What's the real major impact, right? Like, so let the container, the containers, instead of, instead of being able to be out there eight days. So, so you basically, you save like, what's that? 16 hours, right? So really what you're talking about is that whatever is on those container ship gets to their destination 16 hours later, if you wait a whole day. And I'm just making up these numbers. I don't know what the normal, um, what the normal time was. I'm just thinking about what this guy said. And so it gets there 16 hours later. Is that really that big of a deal? Well, if you're a shipping company and all you're trying to do is maximize profit, right? You're going to squeeze everything. You're going to try to ramp up production, in this case, shipping, right? And you're going to try to suppress wages, right? That's the classic way. There's two ways to increase profit, right? You just kind of produce more and more quickly, right? Or you suppress costs. Usually that means labor costs, right? And you don't do things like, you know, you don't have safety inspections because safety inspections, if you can find something that's wrong, you got to fix it. That costs money. So you want to minimize the expenditure of money and hope for the best that nothing fails, right? So in, in this case, basically saying that, look, safety was sacrificed to profit. And the guy says, is like, like, well, look, you know, if you, if you have people sitting in, you know, these, uh, um, uh, these massive uh, ships kind of coming into ports and having to go through all these safety inspections every single time, well, then that's going to cost money. And then that gets passed on to consumers. And, you know, our goal, you know, you know, goes, these companies want to kind of, you know, um, not pass those costs on to consumers and maximize their own, their own gains. And you're like, well, there you go. The guy just said it. <laughs> the guy just said what's going on. Right. And that was like, okay, that's a good analysis, dude. Thank you. You should kind of expose it, right? And then there's a third element, right? The third element, so we've got infrastructure failures in terms of like U.S. long-term lack of investment because of neoliberalism, because of this kind of like, you know, the government is bad thing that's been going on for, for 40 years, right? So that's number one. The second thing is the squeezing for profit. So the lack of safety inspections, right? That's a problem. And then the third one is that we find there's no consequences for bad actors and anti-worker policies. So here's an, here's an article. This is an article from the... Uh, um, this is Brett Wilkins uh, from In These Times, originally published in Common Dream, but here. Uh, there's a report. Uh, this is based largely in a report that came out from uh, Newsweek, right, that did an uh, expose on this. But here, here's, here's this article, right? So, so the ship was called the Dolly, right? So the nine-year-old Dolly was also detained by port officials in San Antonio, Chile. Hold on a second. Okay, so the nine-year-old Dolly was also detained by port officials in San Antonio, Chile, last June after inspectors discovered a problem related to the vessel's, quote, propulsion and auxiliary machinery, unquote. That's according to the Washington Post, which cited records from the intergovernmental shipping regulator Tokyo MOU. The ship's owner, Grace Ocean Private Limited, and operator, Synergy Marine, quote, have been sued at least four times in U.S. federal court on allegations of negligence and other claims tied to worker injuries on other ships owned and operated by the Singapore-based companies, unquote, according to the Associated Press. There's more. Maersk, who was supposedly, like, you can see all the subcontracting already, right? All the subcontracting. So Maersk was also sanctioned last year by the U.S. Labor Department for allegedly stopping employees from reporting safety concerns, document published by, um, documents published by The Lever revealed. According to a July 14, 2023, Labor Department letter to Maersk regarding an Occupational Safety and Health Administration investigation, the Danish company, quote, suspended and then terminated a worker oh, in retaliation for reporting unsafe conditions and contacting the U.S. Coast Guard. The fired employee, quote, engaged in numerous, numerous protected activities, unquote, including reporting a leak and the need for repairs to a ship's cargo hold bilge system, 
alcohol use aboard the vessel by crew members, and inoperable equipment, including an emergency fire pump and lifeboat block uh, releasing gear. There's your third lane. So you have retaliation against workers who report problems. Right? And apparently there was a, a, some other stories that came out this week. You started hearing these first person accounts and talking about how this was, uh, this was a consistent thing. Um, and Maersk, uh, what Maersk would do was discipline workers when they reported problems. Right. So there you go. This is not a, you know, again, that's the one part about that independent headline that is correct. A structural failure is to blame. Yeah. A structural failure, not of the bridge. Right. But of our, our runaway, like, Profit at all costs, ramped up free market capitalism. That's what's the deal. <laughs> That's the structural problem, right? I mean, it's remarkable that, you know, and again, I do believe the narrative is going to get there, right? But it's going to be obviously in mainstream news, it's going to get really washed down and all this stuff. But I think that, you know, the additional hearings that come up and look, and we're going to start seeing these pieces. And you could, I mean, this is such a, window into the costs of the way that we run this society. Straight up. Now, Biden comes out this week, right, and says, by hook or by crook, he basically pulls a Shapiro, right? You know, instead of like the collapse of the bridge, the, uh, like an I-95 where, you know, boom, we're going to fix 95. Now we got the Francis Scott Key Bridge, right? Much bigger endeavor. But he says, no, the federal government, we're going to we're going to move heaven, heaven and earth, I think is what he said, in order to kind of um, get this bridge up and running. Either replace the bridge or get or fix the bridge, right? I don't even know if it can be replaced, but or fix the bridge. And that the federal government is going to bear all the costs, right? Again, let's go back to the beginning. Who is the federal government? Right. Oh, the federal government isn't you know, like out there, you know, it's, it, it's, it's earning wages for itself and then kind of goes out. No, those are our tax dollars. Right. But this is the money that the government is kind of going to be spending. Right. This is money that could say go to something else. Right. Now, again, we could push back on all sorts of problems here because, like, all sorts of kind of, like, assumptions being made, well, all you know, because, like, it's a, it's a single pie and blah, blah, blah. No, the federal government can actually do this, you know, could do this or that. But the point is, is that ultimately the public is paying for the systemic breakdowns of this free market capitalist system. Maersk? These other shipping companies, right? They're not going to fix the bridge. They had all the benefits of ramping up the speed of this, of making larger and larger ships, despite the fact that the ports weren't prepared for them, suppressing their workers in order to squeeze more profit. They had all the gains of it. They privatize the profit, right? But they make all the risk something that we bear. You break a bridge, you should fix it. They were the beneficiaries of this free market runaway capitalist system. Well, again, guess what? You pay the consequences. But we don't live in a political culture that has the will to do that. It's remarkable, right? You socialize the cost, you privatize the profits. That is the mantra of this period of capitalism. And there's six people that paid the ultimate price for this system, this structural failure. And those are those workers who are fixing potholes on that bridge in the middle of the night 
so it wouldn't disrupt traffic. And I believe all six of those workers were immigrants. I'm not quite sure where they kind of settled on all the identities, if they're like all like new immigrants or if someone had been around. I know a few of them had been kind of working on this stuff for, for like a decade or something. So now we also have a political culture which demonizes immigrants, which also contributes to the loss of their lives. It's remarkable. It was devastating. I've been, I, I've gone across that bridge countless times. I used to live in, you know, Washington, D.C., right? And I, my folks live in New York, like upstate New York, and, you know, I have friends in New York City and, you know, all the places, and I would, I, I would, I've been over that multiple, so many times. <laughs> it's remarkable. Well, in other news, um, yeah, Fetterman is kind of losing uh, losing his staff <laughs> because, well, you know, he gets elected, he pretends to be a big progressive, right? Will Bunch was call, has been calling this out right, right down the line, basically saying, when are liberals going to stop supporting this guy? Well, I guess now is the time. <laughs> because there's been some serious turnover in his office, right? Um, in the last month, all three of Fetterman's top communication staffers have left the Capitol. Are, are, I'm sorry, have left Capitol Hill. Um, this is according to uh, a report in the Philadelphia Inquirer by Julia um, Teruso. Nick Gavio, who is the Deputy Communications Director, will leave the office at the end of March to take on a new role with the Working Families Party. Fetterman's former Communication Director, uh, Joe uh, Calvello, left earlier this month to work for Chicago Mayor Brandon Johnson. And Emma Mustian, of the press and digital aid, also left Fetterman's office to work on a re-election campaign for um, Senator Casey. And I'll just read this from, uh, um, from the article. Quote, say, Gavio and Calvello, two veterans of Bernie Sanders' 2020 campaign and Fetterman's Senate, uh, Senate campaign, offered nothing but nice comments about their new job. Um, but clout, this is that article, or this is that column, Clout doesn't believe in coincidence, and it seems relevant that both are going to more progressive spaces, given that Fetterman has recently made a big deal of denouncing that ever-nebulous political label. So, there you go. So Fetterman got elected. You know, again, this is, this is, this, this is, this is really frustrating, because Fetterman got elected because of progressives who supported him and got out there and did the work, right? But now he's kind of putting on that Washington, D.C. suit and deciding that he's going to play the Joe Manchin lane. He's going for the Joe Manchin lane now. Maybe he'll fill the shoes of the Joe Lieberman lane that has just been recently vacated. So crazy. But yeah, Joe Lieberman died this week. Um, There's a fall, complications with the hospital, and he died. Um I had Joe, Joe Lieberlin has a, has a particular um, place in my disdain Hall of Fame. Um, you know, he was the vice presidential candidate and he ran with Al Gore. Um, he was a hawk in the Iraq War. He helped propagate the lies about weapons of mass destruction. He stood fast with President George W. Bush in that kind of devastating conflict. He was a strong proponent of austerity against workers, was no friend to working people. He embraced neoliberal economics and free market economics that kind of caused the destruction of our kind of unionized workforce. I mean, we can go on and on and on with this guy. His biggest donors were big insurance companies. And he became one of the strongest opponents to Medicare for all and any sense of a public option in healthcare. How do you go down the line? This guy is like the Democrat that was worse. You know, and it and, and I remember, yeah, I remember so much about this. And it's just so whatever. No friend of Joe Joe Lieberman's. I actually met the guy once. I worked in uh, when I lived in DC, I worked in uh, politics and prose bookstore. Awesome place. Um and he had a book that came out, which I don't know what it was. And I was, you know, working when he came, and, um, you know, he came to the bookstore as part of his book tour, right? And so he comes in and um, uh, 
you know, part of my job that night was to kind of making sure that the uh, book signing area was set up and all that other kind of stuff. And, um, so I went over, you know, went over, he sat down, he was kind of getting ready for it. And I bring, bring over a big stack of books and, you know, um, put it out there and said, uh, you know, shook his hand, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, just remember that. I remember him having this big, soft, meaty paw. <laughs> That's what I remember about him. <laughs> but whatever. Um, so I just, you know, I, I hope, you know, I'm never, I'm, I don't like to, you know, wish poor the dead for the most part, but um, I do hope that this marks a certain kind of turning point in that kind of politics within, at least within the Democratic Party. We shall see. I don't know if you followed this too this week. You had the, the big kind of blow up and MSNBC and NBC because they hired Ronna McDaniels, right? NBC News hired Ronna McDaniels, who was the former head of the GOP, who was just ousted so they could bring in Trump's people. She was at the forefront of some of the election denial um, stuff. And then for some reason, MS or NBC decided, hey, this would be like a great person to bring on, right? You know, because both sides, you know. There was a revolt at the organization first with MSNBC about how can you have a election election denial who was who was encourage attacks on the press. You're going to bring this person into this. How can you do that? And then MSNBC finally kind of backed off. Said, okay, nope, she's not going to be on our network. But NBC still had her. And then there was further revolts um, among staff and on air talent and uh, journalists about Ronna McDaniel over the same things, and then she was eventually fired. So all within one week. How about that? That was fun. Um, here's another thing that I wanted to talk about that was uh, just about a little bit about the narrative that is being constructed here, like about a, around a really, really real thing, right? So there's this article that came out in the New York Times, I think yesterday, no, today, it was today, <clears throat> Um, about school absences. And you know, it's funny this comes out now. I've been talking to, I've had multiple conversations just this week with uh, faculty, at Kutsan, some faculty at Kutsan University, uh, you know, in our house here and with some neighbors about this issue. And I said literally yesterday, I was, I was talking to one of my colleagues and I said to him that, you know, I said, yeah, it's just, there's this, there's a, it seems to me a, a particular issue with, with some students this year that is different than before. And it's really hard, for me at least, what I was saying, it was really hard, it's hard to put my finger on it. And then I started thinking about it. It's like, you know, this right now, four years ago, right? So four years ago this month, right? I mean, it was March 13th. 2020 when everything shut down because of COVID, right? And so four years basically to the day, you know, or to the month at least, was when all that, all when COVID first ramped up. So that means the students, first year students in particular, who are entering college today had a good chunk of their high, their time in high school was, was dominated by COVID either having to do things online or hybrid or having to kind of adjust the way that classes work because of this, um, the shift to making sure that all materials were online and accessible. So if somebody got COVID, they'd be able to ac access it. Or if they were like from a vulnerable, say, uh, say population, like people that, you know, would, <clears throat> Their life could be at risk if they contracted COVID, especially during those first couple of years. <clears throat> All that happened, so that and that was the the this the largest part of the of their high school career is the students that are kind of entering now are coming to campus now, and <clears throat> so and, and and it pushes down right. So the same thing is true that students who were um, finishing grade school right, during when COVID, when COVID began, are just starting high school, right? It's like my son, right? Students who were in elementary school are in middle school. It's my daughter, right? So, I mean, 
you see all, so this, this kind of cohort is working its way through the educational system. And what they're finding is that there's really significant absences. Um, and th this report in the New York Times is really focusing, focusing on um, um, <clears throat> K through 12 school, right? Now here's here's a statistic, but I want to talk about a little bit about this, this here. So the nationally nationally, an estimated twenty six percent of public school students were considered chronically absent from school last year, up from fifteen percent before the pandemic, according to the most recent data from forty states and Washington D.C. compiled by the conservative leaning American Enterprise Institute. Chronic absence is typ typically defined as missing at least ten percent of the school year or about eighteen days. So. I find it really interesting that the American Enterprise Institute, this is a, you know, a right wing, full on free market think tank in Washington, D.C. Right. They are the ones interested in this question. Right. So I just, you know, put that aside, right? That doesn't mean that the, you know, the, the, the data is being compiled, right? So it doesn't mean there's a problem, but the, there's, it's in the back of my head to say, okay, what's the interest, right? You are a think tank that's promoting free market principles and right-wing policies, libertarian type policies. Why are you invested in this as an institution? Just a question mark, right? And they find some, you know, really different things. So, so for example, the absenteeism now, right, has like is worse among the poorest students, right? It's always been worse among the poorest students, but it went from 19% absent to 32%, right? In the richest districts, it went from 10% to 19%. And the overall average is from 15% to 26%. So 26% of students have this set, quote unquote, what they're calling chronic absenteeism. In the statistics too as well that they offer here, the um, students that went to the most in-person schools went from 16% to 25%. Students who were in the most remote schools, right? Most of, went from 16% to 28%. So a slight, you know, slight difference there. Right, but overall the, the statistics are from 15% to 25% if you do look at, look at the middle, right? So there's that. larger the school district, the more their absenteeism. When you look at racial disparities, non-white went from 17% to 30%. White went from 13% to 22%. So both went up significantly, but there's a disparity in terms of there. Again, the disparity was there at the beginning, but the disparity is increased toward the end. So we have a disproportionate impact on people of color, right? Here's the description of it in the Times. The increases have occurred in districts big and small and across income and race. For districts in wealthier areas, chronic absenteeism rates about went double to 19% in the 2022-23 school year from 10% before the pandemic, a New York Times analysis of data found. So this is New York Times kind of confirming this. Poor communities, which started with elevated rates of student absenteeism, are faced... Um, are facing an even bigger crisis. Around 32% of students in the poorest districts were chronically absent in the 2022-23 school year, up from 19% before the pandemic, right? So just those statistics that I'm laying out there. So that's happening, right? I can say this is also happening at the college level. It's not what this report is interested in, but the, um, the college level too as well. There's been, again, this is anecdotal, right? This is not, but there's multiple, multiple people, right? In different disciplines, right? At my university, like in different disciplines, different size classes, you know, all this other kind of stuff, right? So it's not like just in like the English department or just in the art school or something like that. No, nope. across the university, different faculty noticing, they're finding about a 25% drop off of attendance. Like just suddenly just students stop showing up. And you, you know, contact them. Like, it's just, oh, and then not handing in work, right? Not following things. I mean, so there's a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of going on there, right? So there's definitely something that, that have an impact. 
So, uh, so here's they start looking at some of the suggestions. So, or, or some of the uh, uh, like potential reasons. So here's an interesting passage, right? So the trends suggest that something fundamental has shifted in American childhood and the culture of school in ways that may be long lasting. What was once a deeply ingrained habit, wake up, catch the bus, report to class is now something far more tenuous. Quote, our relationship to with school became optional, unquote, said Katie Rosenbaum, um, Rosenbaum, a psychologist, um, psychologist and associate research professor with the Center for Child and Family Policy at Duke University. The habit of daily attendance and many families' trust was severed when schools shut down in 2020. Even after schools reopened, things hardly snapped back to normal. Districts offered remote options, required uh, COVID-19 quarantines, and relaxed policies around attendance and grading. Today, student absenteeism is a leading factor hindering the nation's rec recovery from pandemic learning losses, educational experts say. Students can't learn if they are not in school, and rotating and a rotating cast of absentee classmates can negatively affect achievement of even students who do not show up because teachers must slow down and adjust their approach to keep everyone on track. Right? Skipping down. And because teachers are also expected to keep post out their work online, often nothing more than a skeleton version of an assignment, families incorrectly think that students are keeping up, says Miller. One last piece, and then I want to talk a little bit about this. So say across the country, students are staying home when sick not only with COVID-19, but also with more routine colds and viruses. And more students are struggling with their mental health. One reason for the increased absenteeism in Mason, Ohio, an affluent suburb of Cincinnati, said Tracy Carson, a district spokeswoman. Because many parents can work remotely, their children can also stay home. And for Ashley Cooper, 31, of San Marcos, Texas, the pandemic fractured her trust in an education system that she said left her daughter to learn online with little support and then expected her to perform a grade level upon her return. Her daughter, who fell behind in math, has struggled with anxiety ever since. And it kind of goes on. There's a lot more that's happening in this article, but I just wanted to, to talk through some of those things because I think that <clears throat> there's a, a – and I brought this up before about this, this the, 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 the attention of learning loss, right, and this kind of this, – this whole idea that everyone's falling behind. I, I have and remain – good morning, Amy. How are you? Uh, I have and remain deeply uh, – let me put it this. I think that narrative of falling behind is a deeply problematic narrative, right? And that one parent says it and gets at why I think that right here, right? She says this, right? She fractured her trust in education system that said her, that left her daughter to leave online with little support and then expected her to perform on grade level upon a return. So there's th there's three things, three aspects of that. So I expected, left her daughter to learn online. Okay, that is something that, I'm mean, again, that is a that was a real problem, right? That was a real problem because that we went from a school that was in person to having to deal stuff online and there was all sorts of clunks and kinks in how to do this stuff. There was no preparation. Like, you know, there, there were, uh, you had to, people had to learn as they were going. Teachers had to learn, so did students. And I, that's definitely going to have an impact, right? So I, I'm not even questioning that. The second part, with little support. So as anybody who has kids know, or as anybody who's been reading about this stuff knows, is that when what happened in that shift online was that you basically kept classroom structure and moved it in an online environment. In other words, if I was a teacher who had 30 students in my classroom, I was expected to be a teacher with 30 st students online. And it was like a one-to-one -one shift, right? But the fact of the matter is that teacher had not learned how to do online schooling. There was no recognition that there is going to be significant problems with following up with students and everything like this, and people who are capable of handling tech problems, uh, uh, handling all the kind of like technological issues that are here, right? It got a little bit better as time goes on, but not much, right? And why, right? Again, these are, and I remember talking about this at the time, it's like, you have a pandemic that is a real thing in the world. And then in order to keep people safe, right, we shut down. 
I don't know if there really was any other legitimate option at that time, other than like, oh, you get it, you get it, you die, you die, right? That was the, what the right wing wanted, right? Too bad for you. Suck it up. Or in the, in the words of my uh, uh, um, university president, right? You got to have some grit and fortitude. Get back in there. Suck up that virus. <laughs> grit and fortitude is what he used. Anyways, with that little support. So the question was, there's going to be an increased need in the midst of this pandemic. And that increased need was not filled. And there were people at the time who pointed this out. There were people at the time who said this. But the resistance by state governments and the federal government at the time was to fund those needs. In other words, if you know schools are going to need more tech help, guess what? You need to hire more people. If in order to make sure that students are kind of getting the kind of one-to-one -one kind of connections that they would normally get in in-person class, then guess what? You're going to need more teaching assistance. But none of that happened. I'm sure in the rich school districts that happened. Some of them at least. That none of that happened because we don't know how to do structure. We don't know how to do systems. We don't think about how to do like big things when it requires government investment. And a matter of fact, good chunk of the American populace is against doing that thing because we've been taught, as I said at the beginning of the show, we've been taught to embrace this neoliberal idea that everyone's on their own and the government is bad and all that other kind of stuff. Right? So that's the second part. The third link in this problem is that said, okay, her daughter had to learn online, didn't get much support, and then here's the key. They expected, the school system expected her to perform on grade level upon her return. And then her daughter fell behind in math. I remember saying this early on. I said, this is a problematic narrative, <laughs> right? Who ever thought that you're just going to kind of go back to normal? And this was the problem in this country, right? The problem in this country is that we're just going to go back to normal. We, we just got to rush back to normal. Even though so many of us are experiencing and still feeling the lingering effects of the trauma of that moment. Of, of feeling social connections destroyed, of feeling like our place in the world uprooted, the anxiety of a pandemic that you didn't know whether or not you were going to die from it, right? I mean, come on. That's a real thing in the world. And to pretend that that is not going to impact the specific things that are that we're learning or how we're learning or what we're doing that is just insane to me. I remember having this this discussion multiple times and arguments I've had with people about this, like we're saying, like, look, look, they're like, well, they're learning loss. I'm like, no, no, no. They're learning stuff. It's just not stuff that's measured on these standardized freaking tests. Is like our kids who've gone through this right now who've gone through this pandemic are having a life experience that most of us have never had as a kid. They've learned about living in a pandemic. They've grown up with that. And that is going to affect their worldview and how they make their way through the world. That is a huge learning curve. And I challenge anybody to suggest that kids did not learn stuff from that pandemic. The only issue is, is what are we measuring as learning? And we have, and again, this is uh, Joe Lieberman, that wing of the Democratic Party is one of the primary reasons why we're here. George W. Bush and the No Child Left Behind, the, the, the strong push for the standardized testing, the Obama administration's idea that we're just going to count everything and assess everything. The, this has been 
generations now of a shift away from the kind of education that addresses the whole person to turning them into balance sheets of measuring these TikToks. I don't mean the platform, these little tick boxes, I should say. This is what like 10th grade level means. This is what this level, they have to do these particular things with this. And there is no flexibility in that structure. So what we did to our kids, and this is where we as a country, I believe, are accountable for this and owe some of the responsibility for the kind of crisis our kids are facing, the ongoing mental health issues and stuff like that. Because we as a society, even though, I mean, look, I personally was trying to work against this, but as a society, we told our kids to go back to normal and try to stuff them into boxes that were not adjusted because of the pandemic. The narrative of getting back to normal dominated everything. We forced them back into a system that wasn't working for them to begin with. The standardized retesting regimes have done so much damage to our schools. For what? For who? The promise of the no child left behind at the beginning, right? At the very beginning. The promise was, is that, look, we need to do a a kind of an assessment of what's actually happening in our schools and making sure that, again, like the name says, no child is left behind. And there were great people who got aboard on those task force, people from all over the political spectrum, people who are invested in education, because they said, yeah, we need to do this. I don't care if it's a Republican president or Democrat president. So yeah, we're going we're to do this, right? And then after about a year on that on that task force, oh, well, I can't believe I'm forgetting her name, Diane, 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 Diane. It'll come to me. Who's like done all this stuff? Did did a whole expose about this about her time on this on this task force, and is one of the leading voices against these, these standardized testing regimes and stuff like this. Anyways, she's. They go down there, and after a year, they find like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We're doing this kind of assessment. We're doing these test scores to figure out kind of where, you know, uh, where people are. We're trying to have this standard measurement so that we can make sure that resources get to where they need to be, right? And then they were quickly said, oh, no, because you had all these voucher people, right, that were kind of in on this, that were in that same regime. You had all these privatization of education people that were in there, these anti-public school people, these right-wing Christian nationalist people who want to kind of take public dollars to put it in their Christian schools, right? All that stuff. They were the ones who were working the policy thing. So instead of saying, hey, look, you have, the promise was you have these kind of like, say these schools in these poor districts, right? Whether it's kind of like in Philadelphia, right? The Philadelphia, you know, um, city schools, or whether you're having it in some like, uh, uh, um, um, some schools up like, like in Pottsville or something like this or Wilkes-Barre, things like this in areas that were also kind of like underserved and they were kind of in more rural areas. And we say, look, these, these kids are not getting the kind of support that they need. So we're going to, we're going to make sure that funding gets to them. So we hire the appropriate amount of people. We fix their schools. So it's not snowing in there. In the winter. I mean, I always remember hearing those stories about in Reading school district, right? Literally snowing inside the school building during the school year because there was no money to fix the schools, right? So no child left behind? Oh, man, we need to fix that school. So actually, they actually have a safe learning environment, right? That's not what happened. What they did, they used that data that they got from those those testing regimes. They used that data as a way to punish those schools and put them on warning so that they could shut them down. And guess what? Guess who would take them over? The charter school people, the Christian school people, the for-profit education people. Because if you read about what the private, the school privatization gurus do, right? Like for the Bradley Foundation, for example, out of Milwaukee, we've talked about them multiple times in the show. The Bradley Foundation, for example, had a whole blueprint for this. And one of the things that, you know, Look, these people that want to privatize our schools, these right-wing folks, they're not dummies. 
They've got an education agenda, but they also got a profit agenda. And what they knew is some of the most valuable real estate that was out there were these schools. And they would do this crazy little thing. If you read some of the history, of this, it's just really, it's so infuriating. You have no child left behind would have put these schools, these quote unquote failing schools, again, the failing language, the failing rhetoric, these failing schools on notice. Schools that are already in completely strapped districts, under like at uh, overflowing classrooms, too many kids, not even, don't even enough desks for the kids, have the outdated materials if they had them at all, snowing in the buildings. And they would say, you're failing. It's on you. You better get those test scores up or we're going to shut you down. Can you imagine being in that situation? You're like, I can't, there's not running, there's not clean running water in the building. And you're telling me that I, it's my fault, right? But that's what they did is blame the teachers, right? You blame the teachers, you blame the teachers unions, you blame all that kind of stuff. And you say that they are at fault. And then you shut the school down. And now you have a big school building. And guess what happened? You have these great little charter schools that would get up. And they, they, do, this, they do this great thing. There'd be a for-profit company, right, that would buy the building, right? Sometimes they do it a nonprofit one, right? But they'd have a separate nonprofit corporation that would run the school. So the nonprofit corporation would have to rent the space from the for-profit company, right? And the for-profit company could make money off the nonprofit. And what's great about it for them, the nonprofit doesn't even need to raise funds because they've passed new charter legislation that could takes money from the public schools and sends it to the charters first. The charters get their money before the public school gets their money. Why? Well, the charter school has to pay the corporation right, that they're renting from. In some of the charter things, like what happened to Philadelphia, because that, that was like, like Bradley Foundations, that was their kind of like their playground for the longest time. Right? Then they would set up as either part of that, like their real estate company, or they set up a, they set up a publishing company. Right. And so they set up a publishing company that would produce handouts and worksheets and, and kind of standardized curriculum for their charter schools. Right. And then they would sell them to the nonprofit. Nonprofit would buy from the poor profit for profit publication company for the school based materials. You see what's happening here? It's a grift. And look, there are some really good charter schools out there that didn't do what I just described at all. That became a charter for the reasons the charters are supposed to be out there. To do innovative, different stuff. To serve underserved populations and so on. And the other key thing about the charter schools, right, is they had it written into the kind of the ways that the laws work, right? Is that the charter schools, they didn't have to accept everybody. So guess who they refused to bring in? People with disabilities, people with learning problems, poor people. Some cases, not in all cases, but in particular learning disabilities, poor academic or performance, that kind of stuff, learning problems. Why? Well, because those people won't gonna, are not going to perform well on tests. And if you don't perform well on tests, then you're not going to be able to kind of you know, get your PR wing out there and basically say, look how great we do. So there's no requirements that actually serve the populations. They can pick and choose who they want. They're choosing the students they want. That is not a public school anymore. They call it a public charter. It is not a public school anymore. It is a selected school. And it's not to increase learning. It's for select. We're going to select these students to create our PR so we can market our grift. Just do any even cursory reading about the history of, not even the history, like last several years of the cyber charters in Pennsylvania. It, it's, just, it's, it's like sickening. What a grift that was. Yet where is the like learning loss crisis for all that shit? So this is, a, I, I mean, I, I point out this stuff because like, look, we have a real, there is a real problem, right? I do think there's real impacts what COVID has had on our schools. But I will also say that we, as a concerned society or people, in, 
have had very little time or space to actually think how we grapple with it. I mean, I mean, look, this is the way the society is meant to get us to do, right? Everything has to be crisis acting. I, I, I shouldn't use those words because I don't mean like the way that they talk about on the right. I mean, everything has to be a response to a crisis that we never have time to actually deliberate and talk about what's going to be best. That we just have to just respond to these endless demands by experts and, 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 and managers and bosses and things like this to just to go, 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 go. And we're supposed to kind of fix it with what's limited time and resources that we have. This is not a way to run a society. This is the kind of like anti-society trajectory that we're on. And we've been on this for a while. But you take from the Baltimore Bridge collapse to what's happening in this absenteeism, the way that we even talk about it, it's the same freaking structural failure, <laughs> right? It's the same one. And meanwhile, most of us are freaking exhausted. So imagine just, I mean, just, just think for a second, just imagine being in a society where we, we had a moment to pause and say, holy crap. We, we, we're, we're going through and still dealing with the lingering effects of a pandemic that killed over a million people in this country. A million people. Whoa. That's like, whoa. A million people, more than a million people, dead. People lost family members, friends. People lost jobs, careers, trajectories in their lives. How do we make sure that we take care of each other as we kind of figure out how to deal with the effects of that? What's going to be necessary in our society to make sure that everyone's got the resources they need to deal with that? We know that online learning and the way that it happened and things like this, we know that's, you know, obviously these kids, obviously anybody, obviously these kids are not going to be, are going to be in a different place than, than, than if they had just gone through the system as it had been before. So where are they at now? So when we have kids that are entering third grade, kids that are entering ninth grade, kids that are entering college, like where are they going to be at, right? And how do we think about our classes and our curriculum in such a way that is going to meet them where they're at? I know we got all these standardized tests like and all this kind of stuff that we're supposed to do over here, but man, it's just ridiculous. It's measuring the wrong stuff. Matter of fact, we had that time to pause and think about the impact. We probably could have looked at those standardized tests and say, if we give these standardized tests to students, it's just going to show everybody failing. It's going to show everything on a downward tra trajectory. And that could actually compound the problem. Because now not only are they kind of feeling like, oh, God, like, I, I don't know this or I feel like I'm behind. Now they're going to be told that they're failing. That they're behind, that they have learning loss. The fact is, is they have not lost learning. They did learn. They learned a lot. They just didn't learn what's measured on standardized tests. And we as a society decided that we didn't care. 
that we're going to measure them from the standardized test because we already have them and there's lots of money being made off those standardized tests. And lots of politicians are running on these standardized tests. And we can use our kids' learning loss as a political weapon against our opponents. It's sickening, really, when you think about it. You know, for the longest time is like, you know, there's been, you see this periodically in things like this, but especially the stuff that I'm much more interested in these days, especially in thinking about in the wake of you know, climate crisis and all this stuff like this, is needing to make a shift to kind of like, you know, a, a care-based society, right? From what we have now, whatever the hell you want to call it now. One in which starts with people and then ask the question, what do people need? And we build stuff around that. Not starts with profits and people be damned. We think about the questions that we would ask if the first questions that we asked were, how do we make sure people are taken care of? If you need evidence to say that we, that we don't do that, well, you remember how many nursing home deaths there were? How many people died in nursing homes? Where's the care there? If we wanted so badly to get our, our, our kids and our students back in classes, in person... Well, we had a pathway, right? We had, we, had, we had guidelines that say you need six feet in between individuals, masked individuals in, in good ventilation, right? Okay. If that's what we need to make sure that we have in-person schooling, then let's do that. But you quickly find out that, well, okay, we, we can't do it in our existing classroom. But guess what? There are tons of empty warehouses, <laughs> tons of empty buildings that are not being used in the middle of the pandemic that could have been used to make sure that that happened. If that was such a priority, we could have done that. But that was never an option. Instead, we took the, the recommendations, right? We took the kind of, here's what you need to do in order to open back up. You have the six feet, you know, six feet distance. Instead of that, instead of, you know, you had counties, you had localities. I was like, eh, we're just going to reinterpret the guidelines. We're not going to do the six feet. We're going to do two because we think we can fit, we can squeeze kids in that way, <laughs> right? That is like the ass backwards way. You know, we, this is what keeps people safe. You say, well, yeah, but that's not going to go and work for us. So we're going to make people unsafe and pretend that they're safe, Right? I don't know. Anyways, anyways, I went way deeper than that than I wanted to. But it just it's just one of these things that's really troubling to me. And it's just a window into the way that we do things as a society. Right? I mentioned this stuff up front, and then, you know, I think I'm just going to have to have uh, get somebody on the show. I mean, I recognize it. Look, and I'm sorry again, bro, there's no, no show this past Monday. It's just been, it has been, it has been something. My, I'm telling you, my work has just been taking everything for me of late. Um, it just, I, I'm exhausted. Um, and rather than burn my candle at, you know, whatever, every end possible, and um, forcing myself to do the show on Monday, I, I just like, okay, look, I'm just going to get to wait till I get to the place where I can have people on and we're actually thinking about it and not feel like, okay, now I've just put myself back for another week in my, in, in, in my job. So, but the stuff that's happening in higher education, if you remember, I think a few weeks back, I think it was probably before I, we, we left, uh, I took a break um, <clears throat> that we went on vacation. My family and I went on vacation <clears throat> before then that there's, um, there was a series of articles that came out about the why the kind of the right wing, particularly the kind of the Trump associated crew, is so keen on targeting higher education, right? Um, and they were looking at policies and what was going on in, in Florida, and looking at over, and it's it's always and this has been an ongoing issue. I totally recognize that, but they were saying this is going to be something that we're going to see in the election, and so in the ramp up for that, to see 
so many attacks on, you know, uh, uh, academic freedom about, um, um, uh, education, like diverse education. So ones here, like I said, to run that down university of Florida, they remember, they kind of, you know, they brought, uh, um, what's his name, Christopher Rufo down there, right, to say, okay, we're going to kind of, we're going to set help consult on uh, setting up a kind of like classical education, you know, let's do the all white guy thing we're going to do. And again, it's just a way, another way of cloaking the kind of Christian nationalist agenda. We're going to go down there, we're going to kind of take over this one college in the university system. And then now at the University of Florida, we're going to set up this, you know, center, well-funded center, right, in order to promote these kind of ideas, the things that you'd find at Hillsdale, Hillsdale College and things like this. Governor DeSantis famously said, we are going, this is going to make this into the Hillsdale of the South, right? So they set up the center and then so much of faculty just not so keen about it, right? And finding out that that center was being able to kind of construct curriculum, but all sorts like this, they could circumvent the entire way that you kind of like approve curriculum and everything like this. And because some faculty members, apparent, according to the administration, weren't like all gung-ho and on board, now they're being investigated because they interfered with the smooth workings and the launch of this new stuff, right? So you've got that there. Boston University, you have students out strike. There's like, you know, strikes going on all over the place in higher education right now. Boston University administration says, hey, faculty members, oh, you're a little bummed out that your uh, grad students are out on strike, or maybe you even support those on strike, but you're worried that you might have to take us by the work. Or what shall we do with those discussion sections, right? Just trying to be helpful, the administration says, hey, why don't you turn that over to AI? and showed them how to do it, encouraged them how to do this, to run it through AI, respond to students using AI, right? So there's another, right? Indiana law, we require your professors to promote intellectual diversity in the classroom or face kind of disciplinary actions or, kind of, or removal, right? Looking at the elimination of tenure, right? That would protection of the kind of like, ironically protection of academic, um, uh, academic freedom, protecting of freedom of speech, protecting of areas of inquiry, right? Why? Because there are some conservative students who feel their foo-foos are hurt because their election denialism and their kind of fantasy politics and fantasy ways of thinking about the world are not entertained. That they don't understand why that, or they feel oppressed because their fascist ideas aren't welcomed in the classroom. Or the belief that white Christians should dominate the world is not taken as seriously as a diverse democracy, right? I mean, things like that. This is a way to overrun, run over intellectual freedom and exchange of ideas. It's crazy. That's an Indiana law. And University of Kentucky president says, you know what? Enough of this faculty having a Senate where they're kind of deciding on policies and programs at the university. Enough of that. We're just going to get rid of that. Why? Because they stand in our way. They talk too much. They, they want to, they, they want to do things about kind of like uh, that are, that's academically integrity, like uh, it has some integrity to it. We just need them to do what we want. So we're just going to disband the faculty Senate and we're going to say have the board of trustees they're going to make the decisions. Why? Because they run things more like a corporation. Faculty be damned. All that this week. So, <clears throat> one thing I wanted to talk more about and I did not, um, but uh, this is really cool. Um, I'm just looking at the time here and I'm, I'm just going to have to jet soon. <laughs> So Bucks County, for example, is, is now this great article in uh, Bucks County Beacon by Cyril Michaleko. Um, I'll read you the first opening paragraphs for our Do check out the article. It says, Bucks County government announced Monday it is willing to fight to save the planet. It filed a lawsuit to hold accountable the, quote, titans of the fossil fuel industry, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, Phillips 66, Shell, and API, for intentionally deceiving the public for decades about the product's role in accelerating the climate crisis, which has caused so much destruction in its wake. Quote, by taking big oil companies to court for their climate lies, Bucks County joins a growing wave of communities that are demanding accountability and taking action to make polluters pay for um, uh, pay for these crises, uh, make make polluters pay for the crisis these companies knowingly fueled and lied about for decades. Unquote, said Richard Wiles, president of the Center for Climate Integrity. Quote. More than one in four people in the U.S. now live in a community suing major fossil fuel companies to make them pay for their climate deception. Bucks County is the first Pennsylvania government to file a climate accountability lawsuit against big oil companies 
but it likely won't be the last, unquote. This is fantastic stuff. And why? So the lawsuit seeks to um, shift the financial burden from taxpayers um, who suffer from climate-related damages and destruction to the companies responsible for creating this climate crisis. In fact, the Center for Climate Integrity released a report last year revealing that Pennsylvania faces more than $15 billion in climate adaption costs by 2040, while Bucks County municipalities would likely need to spend almost $1 billion in that time to adapt to infrastructure to make make it climate resilient. Right? It said, quote, in recent years, we have experienced unprecedented weather events here in Bucks County that have repeatedly put residents and their first responders in harm's way, damaged public and private property, and plagued undue strain or and placed undue strain on our infrastructure, unquote, said Commissioner Chair uh, Diana Ellis Marseglia. Quote, we're already seeing the human and financial tolls of climate change beginning to mount. And if oil companies um, own data is to be believed, the trend will continue. Right. This is a great move. I'm so psyched to see this, right? This is what this is the kind of action we have. In the absence of our government, our federal government to really take decisive action, this is where we got to have the the action. This is great thing. So I'm so glad to see that um good on um um Bucks County um for putting that lawsuit forward. Um final thing and everything we talked about today on this show is uh connected to this last item. <laughs> right? We've got an election coming up. Right. The primary election here in um, Bucks County is on April 23rd. You got to be kidding me. I didn't put this in here. Hold on a second. Is on April 23rd. Right. The last day to register to vote is April 8th. Hold on a minute. Okay, here we go. Last day to register to vote is April 8th, 2024, right? That is like just about a week over. It's easy to remember this year because it's the day of the eclipse, right? Eclipse day is the last day to register to vote. So if you start hearing there's an eclipse going on that day, you're like, oh, crap, this is the last day I have registered to vote if you're not registered already. If, if the, the eclipse is hard to remember, remember it's it's my dad's birthday. So either one, either if you hear it's my dad's birthday <laughs> or if you hear the eclipse is here, that's your deadline, okay? Register to vote, right? And that is true whether you're going to vote in person or if you're going to vote by mail, Okay. So make sure you do this. The last day to hand in, oh God, where is this? It's supposed to be right here. Sorry. I had this, I had this saved and I somehow kind of um, um, messed up here. In person Monday. I think the last day that you can um, sign up to get a, a um, one more time. Hold on. Oh my God, I'm really, I'm really messing this up, aren't I? Okay. Uh, last day. Well, just know that for now. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the 16th is the last day um, that you could request an absentee ballot. Um, but you have to be registered by the 8th, right? You have to be registered by the 8th. So make sure. Right. Today is the 29th. Right. That is a little more than a week away. Right. Um, on April 8th that you are registered. You can do that online. Right. You go PA voter services dot PA dot gov. Right. You just go right there. Um, you know, that, that's all you need. Right. A. Vote. Right. Go vote. You go www dot vote dot. Wait here. I'm going to give you the whole thing again www.vote.pa.gov, right? You go right there, and that's going to give you all the information that you are going to need, right, um, about when 
that you need to register. Primary election day is on April 23rd, 2024, right? That's what I'm giving you the deadline, April 8th. Oh, here's everything. Great. April 8th is your last day to register to vote so that you can vote in the primary election, right? If you have never voted in a primary election before and you're not registered to vote, you need to register. You need to know that you can only vote by for a party. That means if you want to vote in the primary election, that means you have to be registered either as a Democrat or a Republican because it, those are the two, that was what the primary is, right? If you are an independent, you cannot vote in the primary election because those are party primaries. They are not general elections. So if you want to vote in that primary, here's a go. All right. The last day you could, as I said, you could request a mail-in or absentee ballot is April 16th. As I said, the general election, that's November 5th, right? You have until October to register to vote, but why not do it now? Do it right now so you're registered to vote for the fall, okay? You can do, also go to, um, again, vote.pa.gov, right? And you can see if you're registered. I would encourage everybody to do it, right? I do it every single year. I just want to make sure, right, that something somehow didn't get screwed up, right? Something somehow didn't get messed up. So I'm going to go. I'm going to make sure that I've got my polling place there. They got the right information and so on so I know that I can vote, right? That's your job. <laughs> Please get registered to vote and get ready to go. All this stuff, right? I mean, again, voting is not the beginning and the end of democracy, right? Voting is a moment in democracy, a very important one. There's a moment in democracy. But those are the folks that make the policy. So that's when we need to get out there and kind of get rid of these crazies that have been dominating our politics for so long. Anyways, everybody, this is Kevin Mahoney, um, editor and founder of Raging Chicken. Thank you for some, taking some time with me today, and I appreciate um, everything that everybody's doing. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, have a weekend here. For those of you who celebrate Easter, happy Easter to everyone. Um, I'm going to do a beach cleanup tomorrow, which I'm really excited about. We're going down for the day. We're going to pick up a bunch of trash on the beach. Um, something kind of, you know, a little something for the earth on, uh, um, tomorrow. And then we have, uh, you know, we'll do Easter and things like this, do a little Easter egg hunt for kids and things like this, but we're going out. So I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, if you have an extra day or two, uh, for this weekend, may you fully enjoy it. You just know that you deserve it. And, um, yeah, thank you everybody for everything that you do. And uh, we'll be back. I'll keep you posted. I'll try to be more online. Sorry. Uh, keep posting what's coming up. Until then, everybody. See ya. Let me try my people come. I guess I'll fly away now